Oh, mercy. God is so good. Josh, do me a favor. Put the first verse of the last song that they sang back up on the uh, overhead right there. I think that was it. Yeah. Yeah. Gratitude. Deb and I were on the way to church while he's getting that ready. Uh, we were on the way to church this morning and, and um, she said, honey, we, we were just talking about I, I was going to have to miss uh, going to the, the Bible college. They had asked us to go and preach and, and I was going to have to miss it because, uh, well, I, I, hurt my, I hurt my rear end, if you must know. I think I broke my tailbone. But I called the, the superintendent of the Bible college and I said, say, Brian said, sorry, I'm not, not going to be able to make it. He said, oh man, what's the matter? What happened? I said, well, I wish I had a cool story. Like I was fighting off bears to defend defenseless babies. But it was really like I was going to get coffee and I fell on a rock. And uh, so I can't sit down. So the 12 hour trip is kind of out of the question. So he said, oh, man, I'm sorry. We'll pray for your butt. <laughs> That's what you want to hear. You know, it's like, so <laughs> Deb said, honey, we've been doing this a long time. And I said, yeah. I said, when did you start? And she said, when she started. And I said, when I started in, in ministry, not just when we got saved, but when we started ministering, serving. Uh, I said, man, that's a combined 95 years 45 for me and 50 for her, and that's a long time. But um, it's not long enough, right? Because there's more to be done. There's more to be said. There's more to be reached. There's, there's, uh, there, Monty, there's people that, that need what you have. They need the song you sang and the dance you danced. And, and did y'all know Monty could dance? Monty, you want to show us? No? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> What'd you say, hun? Oh, well, my Ansley, the three year old. Yeah, she. I got up one day and I was getting up funny looking off the couch and making weird noises like, <laughs> and she said, What the matter, Papa? You broke your butt? <laughs> just, just go play. So I wish I had a cool story, but Craig, I just don't have a cool story unless I make it up. So I, I do. I make it up. And I tell people I'm making this up. And this, this is what happened. And there was, you know, all sorts of wild animals involved and swords and bows and arrows. and Right. So um, turn your Bibles to 1 Kings. Let's get out of this. 1 Kings. I believe it's 19. Yes, chapter 19. The verse I asked him to put up on there before we, before we get started is, All my words fall short. I got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? You know, that's the way I feel. And that's the way I think all of us feel, um, th that my words just fall short. As much as I would try and as much as I would want to have all the right things and the good things and the groundbreaking things to say, um, they just all for, fall short. Um, and they always will. And I've got nothing new. But you know what? I don't need anything new. When, when God said to me in the dream a few weeks ago that He was going to give us fresh manna, that don't mean something new. That means the same thing we had yesterday, but it's life-giving. It means the same thing we had last week, and it's life-giving still. It means the same thing we had last year, and it's life-giving still. It means the same thing when my 40-year-old child was born and it still means the same thing today. There's, there, there is nothing new that we could give 
But there is something strong and powerful that what we have offers to those who will hear and those who will receive. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning and and our family and what you've built here and what you do still continually. You just amaze me at what you do in the lives and the hearts of people who are hungry for you and want what you want for them and for their lives. And you'll keep doing it, God. And even though it's the same word, this book we preach out of is the same book. It doesn't change. Your word, your heart doesn't change. Your spirit doesn't change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, it still brings new life. It still refreshes us. It still helps those that are hungry and can't help themselves. And so, God, we ask you to do that for us even today. Prepare our hearts to hear what you have to say to us. Amen. I've been for the last, I don't know, week or two, maybe a little longer, I've been kind of going, pouring over this this section of Scripture here in 1 Kings and 2 Kings with Elijah and Elisha. And I want to read a little bit today about the transition, um, the beginning of the transition for Elijah from Elijah to Elisha. Um, everybody knows Elijah. And sometimes we get his and Elisha's name mixed up because they're so much alike. But everybody knows Elijah. I mean, he did some powerful things, you know, some, some, some just some mighty things of God like at Mount Carmel where uh, when King Ahab was the king and his wife Jezebel and, and, uh, and he challenged the 450 prophets. Everybody, y'all, y'all know the story? Yeah. Everybody knows the story. Uh, because that was a powerful story and how he, 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 took, he took the 12 stones and he set up the altar and he took the, the, uh, the, the animals and, and killed them and took their, uh, the, the wood and he made a little trench around it that would hold about four gallons of water and ended up pouring four gallons and then four more gallons and then four more gallons and it ran all over the place and he called down fire from heaven. You know the story and, and how it was just awesome to hear and we, we applauded and it was great. And not long after that, God starts preparing Elijah. He starts preparing him uh, for his home going. And he tells him, I, I, I want you to, to, to pick somebody to take your place, is what he tells him. Uh, and so he does that. And if we look in 1 Kings chapter 19, we read where Elijah left there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, as he was plowing 12 teams of oxen, there were 12 in front of him. As he was, pl- 12 te- as he was plowing, and 12 teams of oxen were in front of him, and he was with the 12th team. Elijah walked by him and threw his mantle over him. Anybody, everybody know what a mantle is? It's like an overcoat if you will, a cape of of sorts. And he threw his mantle over onto Elisha. And Elisha left the oxen and ran to follow Elijah and said, please let me kiss my father and mother and then I will follow you. Go on back, he replied, for what have I done to you? Meaning, do you understand what's just taken place? So he turned back from following him He took the team of oxen and he slaughtered them. Now, didn't we just say there was 12 teams? Would that be 24 oxen that he slaughtered? Slaughtered them and with the oxen's wooden yoke and with the plow. So all of this was made of wood back then. With the oxen's wooden yoke and with the plow, he used that for the fire. And it says he cooked the meat and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he left and followed Elijah and served him. Think about that. Think about now, now Elisha, just for a little bit of history, Elisha was part of the school of prophets. He was like learning. He was, he was training. Okay. He was, he was a part of, 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 I don't know how many there was, but at one point there was 50 of these guys in that school watching Elijah and Elisha as they were about to cross Jordan. But Elisha was part of that school. And when God said, 
that one right there. He went and he, Mark, and he threw his mantle over him. He said, do you understand what that means, what I just did? And certainly he did. He understood. He said, you are transferring the anointing that was on you to me. And it was so impactful to Elisha that he took the 12 teams of oxen that belonged to him, 24 oxen that belonged to him. Now, this is a significant amount of money and potential for earnings for him to have this kind of, of livestock at his disposal. But at the very moment that he received the call from God for something higher, for something more, for something more impactful for the kingdom, for something that he had lived his life in search of and longing for, at the very moment he was willing to give it all up, and he did. He gave it all up. He made the choice, he made the decision in a moment's time to give it all up and slaughtered them and used even the tools, the yokes, and the plows and the things to, 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 to fuel the fire that would cook them that he would give away so that he could follow and serve his master. Not so that he could follow him and call down fire from heaven on, on, on an altar or slaughter 450 prophets of Baal like Elijah did, had just recently done. Not so that he could be the guy that's on the top and that everybody would look at and buddy look, at, look to as a spiritual leader or a spiritual director. Not, not, not for any of those reasons, but to serve meant now that I've gotten this call up, this higher calling. Now my job, as one of the people in the school of the prophets, um, uh, one of the servants, rather, I'm sorry, of Jehoshaphat, later described Elisha's job was he was the water boy for Elijah. He said he's the one that pours waters on his, water on his hands. That's a scripture just a few chapters later. So he gave it all up. He gave up everything that he had in the world, every promise, every possibility that he had to, to advance in the world to be the water boy for Elijah. Think about that. Think about that. Think about the significance of that. And then later, after he did that, Later, when it, when it came time for Elijah, he knew that his time was short. He knew that probably it would be that day that God would take him home. And he was one of two men that we know of in history that did not die before they were taken home. Elijah and years earlier, Enoch. He knew that was going to be his day. And he, and he told Elisha, he said, stay here. I'm going to Jericho. Stay here. I'm going to Bethel. Stay here. I'm going over Jordan. Three times he told him, you stay here. And Elisha said, as you live and as I live, I ain't staying here. I'm going with you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to pursue my heart's desire to serve my master and my God. I am going to pursue this with everything that is within me. You know i got nothing to lose. I've already slaughtered them all. I've already, I've already burned the ships. I've already, I, I'm not going back to that life. i got nothing. As I live and as you live, I will not stay here. I'm going with you. And it was after that you can read this for yourselves. There's a few chapters over in the second Kings, in the first and second chapter. It was after that, after he saw the determination of Elisha, that I'll gladly carry you water for you. You need me to wash your hands? I'll wash your hands. You need me to wash your feet? I'll wash your feet. You need me to cook you something? I'll cook you something. You need me to be here for you? I'll be here for you. What do you need? I, I got this. You, you sit down, Elijah. You rest. It was after 
that determination, and, and Elijah had seen the determination in his young disciples' eyes and seen it in his heart and by his action, and that he truly had a servant's heart. Not somebody who thought this is going to be a pretty good gig. Not somebody who thought I can make money doing this. Not somebody who thought I'm going to, this is what I've always wanted to do all my life. You know, this is awesome. You know, it's not somebody who thought that, but somebody who had truly had a servant's heart. After he saw his determination to stay with him and to not leave him and refusal to be left behind, he said, I tell you what, if you see me when I go, he said, what, what do you want from me? He said, double portion. Double portion. Double portion was usually what was given. Back then it was common. It was given to the firstborn who inherited the double portion more than everyone else. He said, I want the double portion. And he said, if you see me when I'm gone. Now, what the significance of that was, I, I'm not sure other than he had already seen his tenacity. He had already seen his, 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 his determination to continue to stay the course. But he said, if you see me when I, when I go, you'll receive. It's a, you've asked for a hard thing, but if you see me, then you'll get it. And so you know how the story goes, hopefully, that when the time came that a chariot of fire came down and horses of fire is what it appeared to them, to him, to look like, came down and, and scooped up Elijah and carried him off into the heavens. They came between Elisha and Elijah where and all he could see was him being carried up into the heavens. And then all he saw was his mantle, nothing but his mantle, fell to the ground after he was taken away. And what did Elisha do with that mantle? He picked it up. He, first he tore his clothes because he was, he was grieved at losing his friend. And then he picked up his friend's mantle and he carried it with him. And he walked back to the Jordan where they had just crossed over the Jordan and Elijah had used his own mantle and parted the waters. He picked up his mantle. He walks back to the Jordan River. He takes Elijah's mantle and he hits the waters with it. And what happened? The waters parted and he walked across on dry ground. And the men who watched, those other ones that was in that same school, the prophets' school, they call them the sons of the prophets, were watching and they thought, surely the God of Elijah is with Elisha. And this was significant. This was a significant turning point in this young man's life. Because he was dedicated. He was determined. He had started out and was determined not to quit, not to give up. You know, there's four kinds of Christians. There's a kind of Christian. Now here we're going to get to a little bit of meat, y'all. That was the back story. There, there's the Christian that um, hears the gospel, comes to church, gets invited maybe to an ice cream supper or something or a pizza party and, and, or, or, a, or a sing-in or whatever special. Hey, hey, you got to come to this. you got to come to this. But he, he comes to it. He hears the gospel. Or maybe you met him on the side of the road or something and you shared it with him. And it just doesn't last long with him. You know why it doesn't for that first type of Christian? It doesn't last long because the enemy comes in and he doesn't have much understanding. He doesn't have a good background in what he's been told or taught. And he doesn't really get it. He doesn't really understand it. So it's easy. He's easy prey for the enemy to come in and talk him out of it. And you know, the enemy does that with Christians. He talks and where does he talk? Where, where does this conversation take place? Between this one and this one. These two ears right here is where that conversation takes place. And he talks you out of it. Well, it didn't really mean this. Well, you really don't have to do this. Well, I could still do this and be a Christian. You know, that's kind of like the world's way. Uh, back, back in the book of Acts, they said, what must we do to be saved? And here in the book of United States of America, 2024, it's what can I do and still be saved? 
So it's a whole different mindset, right? Whole different approach to this Christianity thing, this walk. It's like I'm trying to, I'm trying to do Christianity instead of be a Christian. Completely different, completely different walks. And the one who's, who's, who's trying to do Christianity is the one who's going to fall prey to those, uh, the, the, the temptings and the lies of the enemy that goes on in his mind and in his head and they're going to steal it from him. And then there's another kind of Christian who the, the, the word comes to him and the opportunities that God affords comes to him and he doesn't have much depth. He doesn't have a lot of understanding. He's got a little bit of good soil, but there's, there's rocky ground. There's rock under that soil. And, 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 and he takes root and he gets started. And he's like, I'm joining the church and I'm doing this and I'm getting me a Bible and I'm studying and I'm going to do this. 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 And it's awesome and it's great. And they go and they tell everybody and they, and they talk, 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 talk. And they got very little walk, 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 walk to go along with the talk, 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 talk. Right? <laughs> And, and, and there's just not a lot, there's just not a lot there because there's, there's hardness under the surface. There's a little bit of, a little bit of openness, a little bit of, I, I, I want this, I can receive this, but there's a hardness in that heart that has to be dealt with that they refuse to deal with. And so when the roots start going down, and God starts trying to do things in their life because they haven't dealt with this hardness. The roots can't go any further and they get to a certain point that it withers and dies. What they had was good. The soil was good on the top, but there wasn't enough of it because there wasn't room in their heart because of all of these hard places in the heart. All of these resentments, all of this bitterness, all of this, this grudge all of this greed, all of this, whatever the thing is in the heart. And you know what they are, because you got them, I got them, we've all dealt with them, hopefully. But if we don't, we're going to be like Christian number two, and the root's going to try to take hold, and, and we're going to fall by the wayside. It's going, to, it's going to go away. And then there's a third type of Christian. And how do, I, how do I know that there's three type, four types of Christians? Look in Matthew chapter 15. That's what Jesus said, right? The parable of the sower. And so then there's a third type that, that he receives it. He's happy. He's glad. And, and, but then thorns, thistles, briars, bushes overtake and they overshadow and they prevent it from getting light and they prevent it from getting water. They're sucking all the water and the nutrients out of the ground and the seed that was planted is unable to take root because it gets choked out. And of course, Jesus, when he explains this parable, he talks about what that is and that, that is what it is for so many Christians today. So many Christians today, like Christian number two, Christian number three, there's a lot of us in our country in this place today. And and because the, the 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 thorns and the thistles are the cares of life, it's money, it's fun, it's stuff, it's entertainment, it's things we want to do, it's the things we can do and still be a Christian, right? Remember that from just a couple minutes ago. What can I do and still be saved? I mean, can a Christian have fun? Yes, Christians can have fun. Can a Christian have money? Yes, Christians can have money. Can a Christian have a lot of money? They can if they're smart enough, work hard enough. I mean, it's possible. Um, they're likely to give a bunch of it away just because of who they are. But I mean, that's, that, that, that's possible. Well, can a Christian do these things or do X things or Y things or whatever? Well, sure, sure, they can do those things. But, but, but be careful because while you're out here entertaining and being entertained and while you're out here pursuing the things that this life affords, and while you're out here enjoying all of these things, and I'm just waiting on Sunday. When Sunday gets here, I'm going to go to church. But between Sunday afternoon and Sunday morning, I'm doing all these other things. These are cares of life. And my focus is not on the master. My focus is not on keeping my eyes on the master. My focus is I'm doing all this stuff and I'm, 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 yeah, I'm going to church on Sunday. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do that. 
I'm going to do that thing. I read my Bible, so when I get a chance, I'm busy. You know, I pray when I can, but you know, I got a lot going on. And, and, and God understands me, and He knows me, He loves me anyway, right? All these things, true. But that's what happens to Christian number three. But now Christian number four, that's Elisha, right? And that is, I hope, many of you in here. Christian number four. Christian number four is the one that has the, the good soil, like Christian number two had. But he has dealt with the hard places in his heart. He has faced it. He has owned it. He has admitted to it. He's been transparent. He's been honest with himself and with the Lord and with his brothers and his sisters and he has confessed things and he's dealt with things and he's dealt with the hard places and more and more things have come into his life to build up that soil and now he's got soil that's got some depth to it. And so that when the, when the seed is planted and when God sends, as Brother Ken says, the storm <laughs> to water it, and sometimes it's a gentle rain, but sometimes we get the storms. And when God sends the sun to warm it and to give it the light that it needs to, to flourish, that seed begins to take root and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper and then it has the fruit that God intended that it should have at the top that everybody can enjoy, that everybody can use. And you're still, you're still not in it for anything other than to serve. You're still, Lashid, not in it for anything other than to serve, other than to give. You've got the depth. You've dealt with your heart. You have repented. You have forgiven. You have released. You have gotten on your face. You have bowed before Him and you have served and served and served. And as He blesses you and you grow and you produce more fruit, what do you do? You serve some more. You give some more away. I've got 10 bushels of apples. I can bless that many people. If I've got one bushel, I can bless that many people. If I've got 100 bushels, I can bless that many people. And what that Christian will do, according to Jesus in the parable, you can go to Matthew 13 and look at it. They will produce sometimes a hundredfold of what was originally planted. A hundred times more than what originally was planted. Sometimes 30, sometimes 60, sometimes 100, Jesus says. But the idea, the goal, is to have the heart of Elisha and sell it all. Sell the farm. Burn the ships. Cook the meat. Give it away. Use the tools to fuel the flame, to cook the meat, to give it away. To love God's people. To follow after the Master. And in this case, I'm talking about Jesus Christ. To follow after the Master, to put Him first. To make your life count as nothing. But His life count as everything. I'm hoping I have about 75 people in here that that's your heart. I know that in all reality, that's not the real numbers. And that's not to put anybody down. That's just to say we're all in different places in our walk with the Lord. But let me tell you, if you're not part of that group that has dealt with the hardness and that has the depth of soil and that has the understanding enough not to let the enemy steal from you and has the, the discipline enough to not let the world Choke it out. If you're, if you're one of those who has, if you're in that place, you can grow to the place. Buddy, Lindsay, you can grow to the place that you have that depth. You can grow to the place that it doesn't matter. The enemy doesn't fool me. He doesn't lie to me. It doesn't matter. This world doesn't have anything for me. I could have gone the way of the world. You could have gone the way of the world. You could still be doing it now, but it, it doesn't hold anything for you. You know what the important thing is. You know what the real thing is. You know that there is a reality that's not seen by the eye. What you see and know in the spiritual realm, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, what you see and know in the spiritual realm 
is far more true than what you see with your actual eye. What you hear with your spiritual ears has far more weight to it and far more basis of truth to it than what you hear with your natural ear. Adhere to, listen to, pursue the truth like Elisha and like so many others, like the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul said, you know, if we're going to win this race, this is in 1 Corinthians, he said, if we're going to win this race, Christian church, if we're going to win this, if we're going to do more than just come to church and, and have some friends and say some nice things and get some goosebumps every once in a while, if we're going to have something that has some substance to it, and that makes an eternal difference in the lives of people that we come in contact with, we're going to have to fight and we're going to have to run not as one who is untrained, but we're going to have to run like one who is trained and disciplines his or her body and approaches it as something to be desired and something to be achieved and something to be put in front of Everything else, even the 24 oxen, even the thousands of dollars, even the, all of the entertainment and all of the fun, that you put it first, that you put it in front of, that it, it, has, it takes precedence over those things. And that's the only way, that is the only way you will make it to the end of your life and be able to say, like that same apostle said, Paul, I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. That's the only way that those words will be able to escape your lips. I fought a good fight and I've kept the faith. Sadly, I've heard many people on their deathbed saying things like, I should have done more. I could have done more. I would do it different if I had it to do over again. Or I've heard them say even worse than that, totally denying the gospel but to hear somebody say and I've heard this a few times as well to hear somebody say when they're nearing end of life I fought a good fight I've kept the faith I've run my race and I'm ready to go home now that's a goodbye letter that's one that you want to hear your friend say when he's, it's time for him to check out not, I've got so many regrets. Young person, listen to me. You don't have to live with regrets. Those things that you could have done, should have done, maybe wanted to do, but something talked you out of it. Go back. Go back and make the choice. Go back and say, God, I will pursue. If you're going to pass up a career to be a rocket scientist... We always think rocket scientists are way up there above everybody else, but pass up that career. If God's calling you to be a missionary, that one is the one that's way up here. Rocket science is somewhere down here. Doctors are great, but the Christian or the Christian doctor is even greater. Scientists are wonderful. Counselors are great. Name the, name the, name the, the occupation. But if you do it without Jesus... It's nothing. If you do it without ministry, it's nothing. If you do it without serving, it has zero impact. You'll be forgotten in less than 100 years once you're gone. People will walk by, look at your tombstone, wonder who that was. But in 100 years, after you're gone, if you've served and you've lived like Elisha's heart was to serve and to live and Elijah's was and Paul's was and, and Timothy's was and Peter's was and so many others and so many I could name even in here if that's your heart. In a hundred years, they may not know your name, but they'll know the name of somebody that you impacted. They'll know the name of somebody whose life was changed because you lived a life that was changed. They'll know, the, they'll, they'll know the heart and be the recipient of the love from some heart because they got love from your heart. That's an eternal impact. That's a, a career to be pursued. That, that's a vocation, if you want to call it that. That's a calling 
to pursue. So don't be fooled. Don't be fooled by the substitutes. Don't be fooled by the lights. Don't be fooled by the dollar signs. Take what is eternal every time. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word today. You're always faithful, always will be, always have been. You're going to be faithful in the lives of those who receive this message and take it to heart today. And I ask that you call them out, Lord, even today. And if they haven't heard the calling until now, and Deb, I'm going to ask you to come to the piano. If they haven't come, heard the calling up until this point, maybe they heard it today. Maybe there's a renewed zeal or, or, or a different heart about you and, and your work and your calling. And you want, to, you want to do something in them. You want to change them. You want to, you want to bring them up to, to the next level, to the higher. You, you want to throw a mantle on them, an anointing that would cause them to be one of yours that's unmistakable and that it will last forever and it won't be taken away by the enemy. It won't be scorched away by the sun. It won't be choked away by the things of the world. But you'll create a depth in them and in their heart, God, that will cause them to hunger from this point on for the rest of their lives to serve you and to serve yours. You're calling that young man out. You're calling that young woman out. You're calling that teenager, that child, that older person, lifting them out of a pit and setting their feet on a rock. You're calling them out today. Lord, you promise your word will not return void. And as I have preached your word yet again, this word will not return void. It will find its way to the heart that needs it, that hungers for it and that wants it and that desires it more than they want anything else, more than they want what's waiting for them at the restaurant or on TV. Lord, draw them. And as they feel your spirit, draw them. And I'm going to talk to you right now as you feel His Spirit draw you. If that's the case for you right now, I want you to answer that call. I want you to answer. Maybe you've made a a, a profession before, but there's something new. There's something different about today. I want you to answer that call. Don't hold back. Don't stay in your seat. I want you to come up here. I want to pray for you. I want to know that you're serious. I want to know that you need it. That you hunger for it. It was just months before God changed the direction in my life and called me to be a pastor. It was just months before when we were in the music business and the things were going pretty good and songs on the radio and things and all the stuff. And it was, it was fine. It was ministry. It was good. But he was changing the direction. And he showed me in a dream that I walked before a big door and somebody that I was working with in the music industry walked through that door and the door shut behind him. And I knew that my time with him was going to be no more. And I looked at a table to my left and I saw a note on the table and the note simply said, just wanted to see if you were serious. And that was God's call to me. I've called you. I wanted to see if you were serious. I wanted to see if you would pursue me right up until the very end. I want to see if you still want to pursue me. Do you want it now? Do you still want it? Though you know it's going to be hard, though you know it's going to be difficult, though you know it's going to be the most challenging thing you've ever done in your life, do you still want it? I need to know that you are serious. I need to know that you want this more than you want your next breath. Forget the stuff. Forget the oxen. Forget the money. More than you want your next breath, you want me. And you want to answer my call to serve that's the kind of person he's looking for. He's not looking for the one who says, I've got it. I can do this. I got this. I got this talent. And that's not the one he's looking for. He's looking for the one that says, I'm a little afraid of this. I don't know. But I know that I'm compelled and I can't say no to this. He's calling you. And you're still in your seat right now. And you're like, 
I, I don't know if I'm really here. I felt a little antsy. I felt a little whatever. And I don't know if, if, if God can use me and if this is something that I can commit to. He's dealing with you. He's talking to you. And as I said, the most unqualified can be the most qualified. As you've heard it said many times and not to just say something that's been used and overused maybe. He doesn't call the qualified he qualifies the called right all you got to know is i'm called to this i have to do this i can't say no to this monty i can't say no it would rip my heart in two to say no What more important thing could a man or a woman devote their life to? Saving the lives of others. Making an impact. And and you don't have to have a pulpit to do it. You don't have to have a church to do it. Answering that call is 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 answering the call wherever you are. It could be behind the steering wheel of a truck. It could be under that truck working on it. It could be on top of a roof swinging a hammer. It could be dancing somewhere. I mean, wherever God has you, you're used right there, right there. How bad do you want it? He wants to know if you're serious. The night I surrendered my life wholly to the Lord, I'd made an attempt or two at it in church camps. But the night I surrendered it wholly and completely to the Lord, 17 years old, said, God, if I do this, it's forever. I can't can't do this for a little bit. It's got to be forever. And I can't do that without you. I need you every step of the way. It's got to be forever. Is that you? Is that your heart? We got a lot of people down here that's answering the call. Heard his voice. I need some help to come pray for these people. Talk to them. Don't talk to them. Whatever God leads you. What we're doing here today is making disciples. What He's doing here today, I should say. Making disciples. Calling people out. Putting them to work. Because there's a lot of harvest out there. There's a lot of need. I'm going to tell you a little short, short thing. Now, when a preacher says that, it usually don't mean anything, but it does today. Something very short. And then I got something I'm going to present to you. Um, this young man over here, standing here praying with Craig, he's been praying with lots of people today. And he came to me during worship, and he said, Pastor, could they use some help up there? And I said, I think they could. Eager to help, eager to serve, eager to volunteer. And he knows I'm talking about him, and it ain't even puffing him up. He's because he's, he's, he's got a humble spirit. But let me tell you, he is not without problems. He's got a lot going on in his life. I mean, a lot that would break a lot of Christians. And yet he's standing strong. How's he doing that? Such a young age. 
those kind of issues and problems, but yet he stands strong. He's got that depth of soil that I'm talking about today that everyone in this room can have. That's what we need. That's what we need. So I'm calling for warriors. I'm calling for servants. I'm calling for people to have the kind of heart that is not looking for any recognition or any pay or any brag or anything like that. Just you're going to work. There was, I don't know how many up here came up here today, but you've made a commitment and a dedication to the Lord. I don't know exactly what your prayer was or what your thing with God, that's a conversation between you and him or maybe the person praying with you as well. But, and I don't need to know necessarily other than I need to know that he's got your whole heart. He's got your whole heart and that there's no part of you that you have withheld because church, that's what, that's what's going to be needed in the time that we live in and the time that we're coming into. You were called put here by God, knowing what we would be enduring and going through as a nation. You were called here for that. It's time we step into that calling. Amen. 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 So thank you for your response to him today and to his word today. Not to me. I'm just a water boy. I'm just a water boy. But to him. And he will use you. He's gonna, he is going to use our young people. I'm telling you what. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be good. And he's going to use us old people too. And everybody's in the middle. <laughs> and everybody's in the middle. You might be in the middle, right? I mean, no, you... even when I'm old, I ain't going to be old. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can follow that example. That's I'll a good one. Years young. That's right. There you go. Right, Amen. <laughs> I mean, I was kind of echoing that sentiment there, Miss Bobby. <laughs> she said it like, even when I'm 55, way on up there. It's like, hmm. <laughs> amen all right anybody else need to say anything the god put something on your heart now don't just say something just be saying something but if god's putting something on your heart and you need to say it i want you to say it you got your hand up Allie? <laughs> all right love you guys you're dismissed